Welcome to another lively edition of the deadly experiment, you out there, boys and girls, children of all ages. Yes, we do have young people who watch the show religiously, if I may use the term, as well as adults. And all of you are part of this, um, this fascinating audience, which I am very pleased to report that a previous program that I produced on my own personal experiences with cancer and the reversal of cancer through nature, God's nature, his medicines, and his servants uh, brought quite a good response. I'm very pleased to tell you that, uh, <laughs> or not so pleased, that I, I have been overwhelmed with the number of people who have watched the program, have learned something that I've learned through personal experience about this industry of cancer. Cancer is a multi-billion dollar industry every single year and profits are to be made, um, you know, certainly bankrolls are to be filled with the usual allopathic treatments of cancer as a disease and doing it symptom at a time rather than holistically or homeopathically. That means treating the whole person at the basic level of biochemistry. And that's what cancer is. It's a, it's a basic holistic problem that envelops the body based upon the lack of oxygen at the cell level. The basic unit of life is the cell. So I'm very happy to say that uh, with the information I provided you and those of you who have followed up on the website um, CassIngram.com that's www.CassIngram C-A-S-S-I-N-G-R-A-M CassIngram Dot com, you have seen the, um, the facts about cancer and all diseases that are degenerative in nature and how they arise from within the body at the basic biochemical level. So we're talking here about an entire approach to cancer that is God's approach to all disease, his approach versus the medical societies of today, which are in fact created by the pharmaceutical industries and the pharmaceutical industries came out of the <clears throat> excuse me the 19th and 20th century cabalists of the Rothschild banking interest essentially bankrolling the beginning of allopathic medicine here in the United States at a time when homeopathy or home-based remedies um, and naturopathic remedies were really taking a foothold <clears throat> in curing disease. It's interesting to note that a program which was known as EDTA, and, and that is an, an, an acid, combination of acids and medicines um, in an intravenous form, were used to treat heart disease. Folks, heart disease was treated and blockages removed by a process of known as chelation therapy. Chelation means to latch onto and to take out of the arterial walls. And that process worked quite well until the 1950s when the heart-lung machine had been created and then the medical approach was simply to operate, simply because there is far more money in surgery and in drug therapy, patented drugs, than there is to be made helping people help themselves and get well. A sad truth. Where does that truth come from? Well, the truth comes from this book, the Bible, the Scriptures, the Holy Word of God, which tells us what this earth age is all about. It's all about the world, the flesh, and the devil, and the deception therein. See, we're all deceived by fancy talk and polemical talk, sophistry, lies, deception, distraction, you name it, the media are full of it. Every day your mind is being invaded by what you see on television, what you hear on radio, what you read in the papers. It's all programming for your Pavlovian response. And that's why we call this period, based on the Word of God, in the book of Daniel and in the Old Testament throughout, the, the city of Babylon is Jerusalem in the last days, you see? 
But now, Babylonian captivity is not of the physical body as it was in Daniel's time, but it's for the mind. The mind, what's inside here? What do you think based upon what you are spoon-fed each and every day in the media? Think about that now. We're going to deal with politics today and next week. Election farces and all of these distractions in this age in which we live. The common thread of all of this is it's in the mind, folks. What does the Bible say about he who taketh the mark of the beast in the end times? What is the mark? Is it a tattoo? Is it an implant in your hand? In your forehead? Not at all. See, people are being deceived even now. The Bible does not say any such thing. It says the mark of Cain, the mark of Satan's children in Jerusalem, the mark of the beast will be a mark in the head, you see, and in the hand doing the work of the synagogue of Satan. Today, we're primed and we're primed and we're pumped to do Satan's work whether we know it or not. Our minds are in captivity. The proof is in politics. You see, in the time when the kings were, in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, were recorded in the scriptures, the times of those potentates, they had already abandoned God's system of leadership. They left Samuel, they left Judges, and they wanted kings to rule over them. The Israelite people, our people, wanted to have a king rather than God ruling over them through judges. No, they weren't satisfied with that. They came out of bondage. They came out of Egypt. The Passover, the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, is our Passover lamb, which we celebrated this past April. I did. Not Easter, but Passover. Why? Because he passed us over. The death angel passed over. Through Christ, who was the Lamb of God, is the Lamb of God, slain for our sake. So folks, it's right here in your scriptures. The captivity of these days, the last days in this world, are not for chains around us, not physical imprisonment so much as mental captivity the captivity of what's in your heart, what's in your mind. You in debt bondage, well, you're already a captive. You owe thousands upon thousands to the bankster gangsters, you're already a debt slave. But most of all, Satan, when he comes and rules in the temple in Jerusalem, in that final five-month period, recorded in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, read it for yourself, his time was shortened from 42 months to 5 months. He will be deceiving you like you've never been deceived before. And that deception will be in the heart, the mind, doing his work with the hand. It won't be a number. It won't be a computer chip that controls you. It'll be what you believe in your mind. Which Jesus will you accept? Now we're going to get into politics, you see, and related to the worldly kings of today for the people of God, the people of Israel, here in the United States, in Europe, in New Zealand, yes, in Iceland, yes, in Australia, all of the Adamic, Caucasian, white, Jacobite people of, of the book of Genesis, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, through this period today. The same people, a different nation, a different covenant, a different land. America today is the unwalled city spoken of in the Bible. The unwalled city of Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem in this age. Not the Jerusalem to come in the third age of heaven and earth when Jesus comes. That's the millennium and into infinity. I, I hope it's not going over the heads of most of you. It's very complicated for some, I understand. But just remember a few basic things. The world system as we know it is coming to an end. And no politician, nobody who's a potentate, no crusader, no political activist or group of 
politicians and activists is going to change America's course of destruction. We are imploding from within, not without. We're destroying ourselves because we have done what the early Israelites did. They came out of bondage and went right back into bondage. They had kings, earthly kings. They had the Ahabs, king of Israel, and the Jezebel, who wasn't an Israelite, brought in because of idolatry. Balaam worship. Balaam worship brought in. And here I am today, you may see me in this new home of mine, broadcasting from a cave. Well, we think of Elijah, the prophet, who was speaking in his cave. He was doing what? He was preaching the word of God. He was telling people about the disasters that would befall them and the kings who ruled over him if they considered or persisted in their ungodly behavior. And they did. And they had to pay the price. Ahab repented, though, in the end. Jezebel was buried like a pauper in pieces, torn apart. We think of Mrs. Clinton today as a Jezebel. We thought of Bill Clinton as the Ahab. <laughs> and now we've got the same minutia all across the board. People, though, are largely being led to the slaughter today by the same media moguls who led us into slaughter in World War I and II. They did it in the Civil War here. The Rothschilds agents in America did it. The Schiff brothers, Jacob Schiff and Mortimer Schiff, two Kenites, sons of Cain. That's right, we're talking about two seed lines here, folks. Two separate opposing seed lines from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15 onward, chapter 4, chapter 5, and 6. Those four chapters you read with a concordance, okay? You take the exhaustive, Strong's exhaustive concordance, and that'll give you a good start as to the mistranslation of words in the Bible. That's right, mistranslation of words. You understand that there are two opposite seed lines? Adam was one, Cain was another. And in her belly, Eve conceived of two children, two twins. First was Cain, and then she continued in labor. In Genesis 4, verse 2, she continued in labor and bore Abel. And you remember the story of Cain and Abel. Cain eventually slew his own brother Abel. He murdered him. Abel was a sheep herder. What was Jesus? The shepherd. You see the types in the Word of God that are perfect from Genesis to Revelation? It's amazing, but this book, the Word of God, is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is perfect from beginning to end. There are no mistakes in the Bible. Only in the translations have people been misled. You see, the mistranslations, sometimes on purpose. Nevertheless, people get the wrong impression. They don't understand that Eve was beguiled by the serpent. The serpent, Nokash, was in fact the enchanter. He had genitalia. So when he beguiled her, what does that word beguile mean? It means to wholly seduce. And that meant sex. There was no apple on a tree. The tree represents the tree of Satan, the tree of death. Jesus represents the tree of life. And that's what he is, the tree of life. No man can come to the Father but by me. So in this garden, this perfectly beautiful garden, we have two people. All right? We have Eve and we have the serpent. Okay? Now remember... Adam had already impregnated Eve, but Satan came along and created another child, so that Eve was the mother, or would be the mother of all living. That means all through the line of Christ, who would have eternal life. Not all life, but all living through Christ. That's the key, through Christ, for he is the one who is the father of all living. And when we understand that, that Cain was that seed of the devil, literally born of Satan, we understand that he has children on the earth to, today. I didn't say he has followers 
or people who worship him. I said that he has literal DNA children today. And they are Kenites, the sons of Cain. Don't care what their religion is. It's what they're biochemically made of. DNA. The Bible does not use the word Adam's rib. There are no such words as Adam rib. That Eve was taken from Adam. In that sense. The word rib does not appear there. So how is it that we've been misled? Because in the original translation, it is known as the Heliox Curve. Heliox Curve is the DNA. God took the DNA of Adam, which he created, and created Eve. And from Eve, we see how the serpent in the garden seduced or beguiled or wholly seduced Eve. So today we have two seed lines. We have Adam on the one hand, and we have Cain. And Adam bore Seth, and Cain, of course, continued his seed line. Right through Genesis 24 and 25, we see Rebekah was pregnant with two babies in the womb, Esau, whom God hated, and Jacob, whom he loved. Now, why did God hate one and love the other? What did these two babies ever do in the womb? Well, they were duking it out. Just as today, the white race, the Anglo-Saxon people, the Scandinavian people of the Bible, the Germanic people of the Bible, all descendants from Adam, all descendants from Isaac and from Jacob are fighting it out with the seed line of the serpent. The Kenites, the sons of Cain. They like to call themselves Jewry today. But in fact, the word Jewry does not appear anywhere in the original scriptures. Only the words Judah and Judean. They are not Jews. Jesus said, in Revelation 3, 9 and in 2, 9. See, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are part of Judah or Israel and are not but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan, that lineage of Cain. Cain murdered his brother, so Cain was in fact a murderer who cried out, Am I my brother's keeper? When God said, What hast thou done? God knew what he had done. He wanted to validate it and verify that Cain was a deceiver like his father, Satan himself, through the serpent. Satan lied, so did Cain lie. I'm not my brother's keeper. What have I done wrong? You falsely accuse me. You've put a curse, a price on my head. And God protected Cain and his seed line right down through this age today until the very end when Jesus returns and destroys Jerusalem from off the face of the earth. Off the face of the earth he destroys Jerusalem. He says so in a number of places most likely and most definitely in the book of Luke and he talks about it in 21. He talks about it in Matthew 24. He talks about it in all of the Gospels and in the Apostle Paul's writings, particularly as we see in the books of the New Testament, where he talks about the city of end time prophecy, the city of Antichrist. This is what we are dealing with today. All politics is deception, all politics is distraction, and if you believe that a Donald Trump or a Ted Cruz or a John Kasich can save you, God forbid, a Bernie Sanders <laughs> or a Hillary Clinton <laughs> can save you, forget it. There is no turning back America. America cannot be saved through politics, through economics, through any kind of political action whatsoever. America represents the tribes of Israel today who left Jerusalem. Remember, they came out of bondage, Assyrian captivity. In a few hundred years, was it 400, 500 B.C., when they finally came out of Assyrian captivity, the northern tribes known as Israel would cross across the Caucasus Mountains through Europe and then here to the United States. That's historic fact. Those are the tribes of Israel. Judah and Benjamin, of course, went to Jerusalem and ultimately to Europe. At the time of the collapse of the empires, of the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire, they were known as Scythians. 
Visigoths in Gaul. These were the people who would eventually resettle Europe. Judah, Germany, Bene Grazie, Benjamin, Italy, and Iceland, and other countries. These are the tribes of Israel, not the so-called Jews, the synagogue of Satan. Two opposites, two seed lines. How corrupt is politics today? We'll show you how corrupt. If you're putting your faith in a political victory in the fall, and we may not see that election because it is very, very, very possible that an attack on America like 9-11 may happen, preventing an election process, in which case the President of the United States now will maintain that form of control. His government will extend itself and the American public will gladly allow it when we are under attack as we were on 9-11 by the same people that we talk about in that satanic seed line, the synagogue of Satan. Israel was directly involved through the Netanyahu government, the Sharon government here in the United States in owning the Twin Towers and rigging them for explosions to collapse. Planes could not go through them, could not collapse Twin Towers, and they did not. It is a scientific fact. How corrupt is the media? We've just shown you. In medicine, the media will not report on what we have shown you to be the case. What we have shown you to be the case with regard to healing from cancer, healing from anything, arthritic conditions, diabetes, even Alzheimer's disease, tremendous breakthroughs in alternative medicines and alternative healing based upon the Word of God and what He tells us, what He gives us, the oil of oregano, the juice of wild oregano, P73. See, if they can't tell you the truth on medicine, how do you expect the media to tell you the truth about anything? You can't. We've seen that with Lying Lester. We've seen that with Lion Bryan. We've seen that with Walter Cronkite, despite the image that was given us of Walter Cronkite as the father of all integrity in the media. For years, the American people were lied to by the David Sarnoffs at NBC and the William S. Paley's at CBS. Now, they out and out own virtually CNN, an Israeli company, an Israeli coitery. The number two man at the Federal Reserve, now Stanley Fisher, came from the Bank of Israel. Friends, it's all in the cards. It's right here in your scriptures, how it will end, where it will end, and when the millennium will begin. Right now, I want to show you how corrupt politics is. We're going to go back to the year 2000 election, when it was exposed that through computer programming, an election could be, in fact, fixed. The numbers changed and rigged. Right now, this is the testimony of one of the computer programmers from Florida who engineered a district, the Feeney district, Congressman Feeney in Ohio in that year, I believe. Let's, let's have this, this presentation right now, an admission from a uh, computer programmer. Mr. Curtis, would you please state your full name for the record? My uh, name is Clinton Eugene Curtis. And where do you reside? Tallahassee, Florida. And what is your profession? I'm a computer programmer. Would you please speak into the microphone so the audience can hear your testimony? I'm a computer programmer. Mr. Curtis, are there programs that can be used to secretly fix elections? Yes. How do you know that to be the case? Because in October of 2000, I wrote a prototype for President Congressman Tom Feeney at the company I worked for in Oviedo, Florida, that did just that. And when you say did, did just that, it would rig an election? It would flip the vote 51-49 to whoever you wanted it to go to and whichever race you wanted to win. And would that program that you designed be something that elections officials that might be on county boards of elections could detect? They'd never see it. Mm. Mr. Would you answer that question once again? They would never see it. So how would such a, such a program, a secret program that uh, fixes the election, how could it be detected? You would have to view it either in the source code or you'd have to have a receipt and then count the hard paper against the actual vote total. Other than that, you won't see it. All right, Mr. Curtis, uh, if you had been asked 
you or others with your professional expertise have been asked to design a protected program to, that would protect the Ohio elections from against, against such software to fix the election, could you have done so? If we've been asked to make a program that could fix the election, sure, anybody can do it. No, could you have designed a program or to a procedure or a protocol that would have protected Ohio against this kind of rigging? No, you have to look at the source code. You have to get probably programmers from both or all parties to look at the source code and determine if there's anything in there that shouldn't be there. I mean, it's a simple program. You're adding one to a person's total. It's a hundred lines of code tops. There's all right. If uh, are you aware of whether there was any protective action in Ohio against this kind of vote rigging through software? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. You were you were not asked to assist in the development of any protective system. Is that correct? No, I was not. In Europe, have you uh, reviewed at all the election results in Ohio? No, I haven't. Okay. Given the availability of such vote uh, rigging software and the testimony that has been given under oath of substantial statistical anomalies and gross dis dis differences between exit polling data and the actual tabulated results, do you have an opinion whether or not Ohio election, the Ohio election, presidential election, was hacked? Yes, I would say it was. I mean, if you're if you have exit polling data that is significantly off from the vote, then it's probably hacked. And your testimony is under oath? Yes, sir. And the testimony you've given is true? Yes, sir. Thank you. How do you like that? Right before your own eyes, an admission of how elections are rigged, how they're engineered, how outcomes are created, how the candidate that is meant to win will win. Folks, it's all in the bag today. And besides, it doesn't matter who is in the White House. We're going to show you that next week because each administration, since the administration of Woodrow Wilson, was controlled and engineered, orchestrated by this cabal since 1912 and 13, and we'll show you how and why today there are a variety of ways of controlling the election cycle and eliminating any potential threat to the system by politicians or people who are statesmen who say they're going to fix the problem of America. Friends, there ain't going to happen. There ain't going to be no savior except the savior. No politician, no crusade, no silent majority, no moral majority is going to do it. It has to be done from God and only by his children getting on their knees and coming back to him. And that isn't about to happen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and repent of their sins, I will heal their land and restore it. You don't fix the, the attic before you fix the foundation, folks. That's where it begins. Next week, part two of electioneering and the kings of modern Israel. Rick Adams, thank you for joining us. So long and Yahweh bless Israelite.